It's July 4th, 2012. I'm Jen Burt, and this is 508, a show about Worcester. Go, go, go. Go, go, go. <laughs> and now we're going to go check out this beehive over here. So, right now these bees have been in here for about uh, a couple months now. We got them. They come in a little package. Um, or they come in a nucleus hive where they've already started settling into the hive. So, that's what we got. Um, then you slowly add your boxes onto the hive. So these bees fold up one, two boxes. And now we're checking if it's about time to add the third box. So. And it's not the ideal time to check these bees because it's a little late in the day. But all right, I'm gonna put this camera down. Alright, so give him a little spray with the smoker over here. And then take this box off. They've kind of sealed it up a little bit with their, uh, their propolis and their wax. So I started taking a beekeeping class with the Worcester County Beekeeping Association. They're pretty awesome. Um, you can take a class for $30. It's a seven week class. And you pretty much learn everything you need to know. And let's see, I'll put that down again. Oh no. So that's what the inside of Beehive looks like right there. And so it looks like they have almost completely built. Oh, this box. We're gonna have to put on another box. Um, and you can see they got the little wax built up they got going on. And the first two boxes you kind of keep um, for uh, for them to build their little hive, and after that you get honey. So that's gonna be exciting. But that won't be until the fall. So. Ah, you can see honey, wax, and I don't know if I can get a whole frame out here with we'll hold in this camera, but we're gonna try. And the bees are actually and yeah, so that class it's a bunch of old kind of old time beekeepers. It's been doing it for decades. Um, and you can sign up for a family membership. So you can go with like a bunch of your friends. They don't even have to technically really be your family. All right, let's see if I can pull this out and show you guys. All right, that's not happening. So we're gonna bring this back and <laughs> Ah, I'm going to check this beehive, and Mike and Brendan are going to tell you a little bit more about what is happening in Worcester this week. So here we go. Ha! Brilliant. That's ridiculous. We don't really know what just happened because we were just watching it through the window here. It was terrifying, though. Amazing. Brendan, how are you doing? I'm good, man. How are you? Good. I'm Michael Benedetti, and this is Brendan Mellican. And this is a weekly program where we talk about things of Worcester, hopefully that are interesting things, not necessarily things which are like breaking news things. There's definitely been breaking news in Worcester this week, various crimes and things, but as we're, all that. we're not going to talk about that. As Brennan said, that's a bit above our pay grade. Whereas the existence of bees and beekeeping in Worcester County falls right, right in under the, uh, right under the bar. What do you think about these bees? That's amazing, man. I'm, I'm terribly allergic to them, so I mean, I, I think I'm going to stay far away. But mm -hmm. uh, I, they're just—they're great to watch. Right? Well, from a distance. Mm -hmm. We I'm should. Uh, fly just flew by. Now I'm going to be skittish all night. Brendan, I notice you have the key to the city. I do. Back. I've got nobody to give it to, though. We should. I we got should it back from Jose Canseco. We should talk about the last time on the show. We had a man claiming to be Jose Canseco. We later found out it was not Jose Canseco. Mm -hmm. We managed to get the key to the city back from this. Had to fight him at the Marshfield Fair. 
Charity and, boxing match. And uh, the day after the supposed Jose Canseco was on the show, actually, there was a little bit of a dust up on Twitter about where one of the Tornadoes players was saying, if you want to see Canseco play, tonight is the last night he's going to play. And then everybody called all uh, all the journalists, like talked to people. There was some, <clears throat> Andy Lacombe from Channel 3 said that he talked to somebody who was like inside the Tornadoes organization who said something along the lines of like, Canseco will stick around, but not as a player. He'll mm-hmm. be in some other capacity with the team. Uh, everybody else on the record denied, denied, denied that he was leaving the team. However, very soon after that, he went on the disabled list and has been on the disabled list the past few weeks. Correct. So, yeah. Receiving his uh, rehabilitation locally, though, but Farallon, uh, if I'm not mistaken. There you go. Uh, and last week was his birthday. Turned 48. Happy birthday, Jose Canseco. And uh, Jose, if you're still looking for lucky uh, lottery numbers, you should probably start with 48. That's a good idea. Also this week, also since the last show, we haven't done a show in like three weeks. The art, the Worcester Art Museum is free this summer. Mm-hmm. It's very exciting. With the new front doors open. What, what's the new front doors? I have no idea. I haven't been down there with the free passes. They, they were doing something with opening up the, uh, the doors. This is one of these buildings that has like a giant beautiful door that is it's just not sealed used. sealed shut for it. <laughs> well, yeah, it's funny. You mentioned that. I was up at, watching the fireworks last night from the auditorium. And mm-hmm. those giant, beautiful doors are all, they, they're like barely on the hinges anymore. Half of mm-hmm. the doors look open. I, I wouldn't be surprised if there's like, it, it's, it's like animals, wildlife living inside that building now. The auditorium. The auditorium. The stairs are crazy, too. They're, they're barely secured. Walking up the stairs, mm-hmm. you've these giant 10-foot-wide marble slabs that just teeter back and forth. On. It's awful. We do some of that building. Where, anyway. Where's Counselor Joff Smith to get us a uh, law school and we need him most? Is that what they're going to put in the auditorium? That's what he wanted to put somewhere downtown. It's not going to happen. Or the, uh, it's not going to happen now. No. People who voted Josh Smith out of office, too bad. Thanks, folks. Um, the city is... City officials have been talking about trying to crack down on panhandling in the city. Now, people will remember that in... I think it was 2005 and 2006 mm-hmm. was the last time that the city talked about cracking down on panhandling. And we talked about this a lot on the show as this was sort of winding down. Like... Basically, there was an anti-panhandling campaign that was put out by the city that the city council signed on to. And it Mm -hmm. was that we would have a public awareness campaign about you shouldn't give money to panhandlers because they're just going to do something stupid with the money. Also, this would be combined with, like, basically a clearinghouse for donations that people wanted to give in lieu of seeing. When you see a panhandler, it's like, oh, I will give $5 to Mm -hmm. this day to whatever clearinghouse. Also, there would be um, some sort of cooperation among the social service agencies and coordination in dealing with individuals who were like panhandlers to help them sure. turn 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 their life around or whatever it would be. Mm-hmm. Um, it was kind of the, a social version of like a uh, "Don't Feed the Bears" campaign. Sure, sure. So there was a lot of angles to this campaign, um, and the only angle that was actually implemented was let's put up some signs telling people don't give money to panhandlers, right. which probably not effective. Uh, because again, like, you know, like if you're not going to give money to panhandlers, you're not going to give money to panhandlers. If you are, you are. Um, none of the other stuff was actually implemented as far as like, let's actually try to deal with these individuals. And there were only, there's only whatever, 10, 20 people in the city was who panhandled. Um, so uh, many of us felt that this was sort of a, that this was like a really obnoxious thing to just put up signs being like, don't give to people who ask you for money. Right. Because it's honestly your decision. You're an adult, you know, and like. Many of us, would, from a Christian point of view, would say, like, if somebody asks you for help, you should default to give them help, only if you have a really good reason to suspect that they're going to do something self-destructive with the money. Yeah, that's not that's what we have money. banks for, is to say no to people who ask for money when they need it. There you go. So, anyways, the last time we had it, so this anti panhandling campaign previously had lasted for, like, a year, year and a half, and finally was wrapped up, because all the city, again, had done, basically, was put up a bunch of billboards and signs. Mm-hmm. Almost all of which were vandalized. Some of them are still up there, though, right? Like the, no. the off ramps from two ninety. I don't think so. Are they? Have you seen them recently? I can't remember the last time I looked. For whatever reason, I, th- I feel as though there was one when you were getting off two ninety uh, from the west okay. uh, at Kelly Square. And for some reason, in my head, I can still picture that sign being up there. Maybe it's come I down. Though. I haven't seen it. I mean, like we talked to city. Those of us who were organizing against the anti panhandling campaign. Mm-hmm. Um, not to say that we were propane handling. But, Mike, I mean, you got to remember there are still uh, street signs in Worcester that yeah. have uh, Jordan Levy for mayor uh, bumper stickers on the back sure, of them. So sure. it's, there is it's quite possible. <laughs> yes, yeah, so, I mean, we were told by the city, by, I think, I don't remember if it was Julie Jacobson or not. I feel like it was a Julie Jacobson type person had a mm-hmm. meeting with us and was like, this thing is done. Yeah. Just to clarify. And in fact, most of the signs, at least all the signs I was aware of, were taken down. Okay. I think if there was any remaining sign, like the, the extent of the extent and ferocity of vandalism against these signs was such that I feel like if there was any 
remaining sign, it would have just been like... They're covered with Jordan Levy for Mayor stickers by now. Somebody would have got some thermite out there and taken that thing down. (laughs) So um, anyway, but now there's people are talking about this again, and I don't know why. This is presumably... People are like, oh, for the city square unveiling, we want to like make the city look clean, or maybe for some political convention or something like this, we want to clean up the city. So like, how can we get these guys out of the way uh, for that time being? Anyway, the city council, it's amazing. that This is just like Groundhog Day. Like Even Councilor Rushton drags up the same exact stories of, I saw a panhandler do this, I saw a panhandler, the same exact ones from like six years ago, being dragged out as like justification for, we failed before, but we've learned our lesson from our previous failure, and we're ready to try it again. Yeah, the thing that's good that, here. Let me throw this back at you. And you, you walk the city probably yes. more than anybody I know. Yeah. Um, Panhandlers don't don't panhandle walkers though, because they know that we have no money. But do you do you see? I mean, do you, do you, do you feel as though that one there are many more panhandlers than we've had in recent memory? And more importantly, are they do you, when you're walking and passing an intersection, do you see people actually getting accosted by panhandlers? Or do you think that we just are still living in a city where folks are terrified of interacting with strangers? I don't see any rude behavior going on. On the other hand, there's definitely could be there's definitely rude behavior going on because there's discussions of this, for which I believe that we have laws about how you're supposed to walk through traffic and whatever. And if somebody wants to bust a panhandler for like doing something to your car or wandering in a dangerous way in traffic, like fine, there's plenty of ordinances to deal with this. Right. Like I think one of the like I like I have. And so whether there's more pain handlers or not, I don't know. I think it's hard to say. Like, there's definitely more than there were six months ago, because six months ago was the dead of winter. Right. I feel like there's probably more than there were last year. I don't know at what point people say, oh, this is this is a crisis. One of the reasons that it completely pisses me off to hear people like Councilor Russian, who should know better, bringing out these anecdotes is because it's all anecdotal. Right. It's because, and part of the reason is because the sample size is so small. There's only 10 or 20 panhandlers in the city. Mm-hmm. So you can't even really have very accurate statistics. It's like we talk about various crime statistics in Worcester. Right. For example, things involving murder and whatever. Like, thankfully, we have very few murders. But so, like, it's hard to sort of figure out what's working and what's not working to stop murder because murders are so rare anyway. It's hard to figure out what is actually influencing the ebb and flow of panhandlers because, like, two panhandlers get the flu and suddenly like panhandling has ended in the city or like two panhandlers no, it, move to town and suddenly we have a panhandling crisis and, and crime it would appear even though there's no shouldn't be any relationship between panhandling and crime that's probably the appropriate way to look at things whereas as of the t- today of our taping right, right we've had seven murders this so far this year in the city and that sounds awful because we typically don't have a lot of murders in Worcester but according right. to the way the department of justice breaks things down that's just 3.5 murders per 100,000 people and if we keep it right here through the rest of the year it's actually not a terrible murder rate for a city our size. Right. It's tragic and all sorts of other things, but it, it's not the sort of uh, it, it's still become it's still within the realm of statistical anomaly as right. to whether or not if there's something actually happening. So right. yeah, I mean, a, a bump in people on the side of the road, also in the midst of the worst economic crisis uh, since the Great Depression. Yes, it's probably it, it, there could be something there, but if there's something mm-hmm. there, it's probably a hell of a lot deeper than what is within the capacity of the city council to deal with. Yes, we could ask if a city government, which is generally uh, again, hostile to both towards business and to the poor, like suddenly saying, oh, and now there are these, these unemployed poor people causing us <laughs> a problem. Could this be part of the problem? I don't know. They're Any- all former hot dog vendors. I don't know. They're probably. <laughs> anyway, so I, you know, like, again, like I'm willing to say, like, sure, there's plenty of bad behavior, like crack down on bad behavior. Sure, people spend money that they panhandle to do alcohol and drugs. Sure. Like there's people who are panhandlers who like, I feel like I know enough of their situation that I will give them some money. And there's people who are panhandlers that I will not give money because I know that they're dirt bags, and I'm like. Until but, but, but see, that's the stuff that drives me bonkers, right? Like, because like when I go to work, there's there's a, a certain portion of the money that I earn from working a, a so-called le- legitimate job yes. that is spent on alcohol. Yeah. Right? Does that mean that my employer should stop paying me because I'm spending my money on booze? It, like, sure. That, you can certainly take it to another level where you're going to make an argument about uh, you know the way we deal with addiction is, in society. But right. that again, it's above our pay grade and certainly well above the pay grade of any single person on the Worcester City Council to be trying to determine who, what the appropriate amount of uh, alcohol yes. intake from free money is. Who's the deserving poor and who's the undeserving poor is always an interesting question when you're dealing with charity. Anyway, I, I mean, I think the other angle on this is like the civil liberties angle, which is... The Supreme Court nailed this one already? <laughs> well, yeah. Like, the First Amendment nailed this one already. Like, so, I mean, potentially the city can do something much like it did the last time, which is put up mean billboards and pretend that they're going to do something with social services, which they're not going to do because it's complicated. But if you, like, the last time actually a bunch of ministers signed a letter when the first thing, when it first came out, 
supporting it because it looked great on paper because it involved this like awesome social services initiative. And Worcester social services actually cooperate with each other really well. So it's not with, it's not outside the realm of possibility that they could be doing something like this. Worcester's ministers also signed a letter after a year against this thing because they realized what a what ridiculousness it was. So one possibility anyway is to do something like we did the last time, which I feel like will not be effective because we have failed. And I don't know, I would love to hear somebody articulate, if somebody, I, I could certainly be swayed on this, like somebody can articulate, here's the thing that we screwed up the last time and this is the thing that we can do that will actually deal with this problem in like a reasonable, humane, productive way. Cool. The other, so the other way to deal with this is some sort of like ordinances mm-hmm. against this. And again, it invo- you know, again, like, and the problem is that it's like you're fundamentally standing on the side of the road holding a sign, mm-hmm. which is fundamentally a pretty basic like f- First Amendment free speech kind of right. thing, you know. And like somebody will say, well, you can't have a hold a sign that's asking for money. Well, you can hold a sign asking for whatever then. I mean, I feel like people who are actually motivated to panhandle can easily, will be easily be able to get around anything which is like you have to get a permit to ask for money on the side of you the You know road. what? If the city council passes that kind of ordinance, I promise every member of the city council I'm going to start driving around. Instead of keep making sure I keep $1 bills in my pocket to give to people who are, who are panhandling, I'm instead going to make sure that my car is always loaded with sleeves of nips of Dr. McGillicuddy, and I'm just going to, whatever the sign is, if it's not asking for money, I'm just going to hand out shots of, <laughs> of Dr. McGillicuddy's to everybody on yes. the street corner. So well, yeah. thank you, Councillor Toomey and Councillor Rushton. That's well, what you're going to create, is me throwing nips at, uh, at strangers. I think there's actually some, something in there, but I want to bring this up in a second. Anyway, so anyway, the, I think the, the alternative to just putting up mean signs is to actually put out some sort of ordinance. It seems like it would be hard to create an effective ordinance that was also not unconstitutional. Certainly, cities are routinely sued over ordinances like this and lose. Certainly, the Worcester City Council, it seems like, and Connie Lukes has been trying to get, I guess, get details about, is enthusiastic about passing ordinances that are going to get the city on the wrong side of an expensive lawsuit. <laughs> And so I wouldn't be surprised if they, again, like tried to pass some sort of illegal ordinance. And Well, this is an important thing, too. And you, would, again, I think would be more, uh, you'd be more close to the people who would be capable of doing this than I would. But who would be the entities in Worcester that if the city did pass a clearly unconstitutional ordinance, right? Even th- That's kind of the, the, the catch-22, is the right. city can pass an cl- a, a undeniably unconstitutional ordinance, but somebody still needs to file a lawsuit to challenge that ordinance. Who would be the uh, associations or the agencies in Worcester that would be willing to step up and put cash on the table to you know, uh, enforce or, or make sure that the courts are actually able to take a look at the, such an ordinance? The American Civil Liberties Union. Okay. So, so like, I know that the, the, the local ACLU is aware of this panhandling thing and is not happy with the idea of some sort of anti-First Amendment ordinance being passed by the city. Mm-hmm. Um, I was going to say, I guess just to wrap this up, like, I feel like if we were living in a slightly more Machiavellian city, mm-hmm. and again, I think this is really around like there's a week or t- there's a weekend or two that we're trying to get the city to look really nice for visitors. It's what I think is going on here. If we were more Machiavellian, for one tenth of one percent of what would be spent on any of this business of having an anti panhandling thing, you know, there could be some city employee with just cases of whiskey, mm-hmm. just going to every panhandler in the city and being like, go on a for the go on a bender, my brother. Right. You know, like, get drunk now and stay drunk for the next four days, and my problems will be solved. And you could probably make an argument that in bigger cities, that's exactly what happens, that people are either put on buses and brought elsewhere. And I'm not <laughs> saying that's right, but, I mean, when you have a right. convention or what... That's what so you do. When, when the Republican National Convention shows up in Tampa I'm gonna, this summer, I'm going to guess that Tampa has its fair share of, of, of homeless people sure. and people living on benches and people standing with signs asking for money for whatever reason. I'm right. going to guess that a fair number of them are going to find themselves in other parts of the state. Uh, by the time the convention rolls around, and they'll mm-hmm. probably have be, may, managed to wander back or, or hitchhike back to Tampa by right. the time the convention is over. Right. But they won't be there for the convention because that's... A, and I'm not saying that's right, but yeah, I mean, if there is just like a weekend that people want to make people go away, you probably could. Like you said, 10, 20 people, make them go away. I mean, open up open up a high school and just have a big party for panhandlers Rent for a, a long weekend. Rent a couple of hotel rooms, get a keg. It's, it's on. Cool. Yeah, I'd, cool. I would actually go there to whatever <laughs> over whatever big thing the city has planned. But well, there you go. Anyway, so this is our this is the five away program. Thank you for watching. It. Is that it? No, it's, we get we get we got more time. No, okay. This is, this is um, uh, Carl Paulson, who was an uh, uh, old time Catholic worker, lived in Upton, uh, died this week at the age of ninety eight, the ripe old age. He was at the Catholic Worker Gathering in two thousand eight and was. Uh, universally recognized as the oldest Catholic worker in the world at the time. He was actually someone who was known to both Dorothy Day and Peter Marin, co-founders of the Catholic Worker. So I certainly mourn his passing. Nice guy. 
Um, I don't think we're going to talk about, maybe we'll talk about alternate plans for the library parking lot today. I want to talk about Occupy Worcester stuff, and I want to talk about John Lurie stuff. We could talk about J Joe Hart stuff if we have time. Um, so Occupy Worcester, I'm still not sure if this is a thing. To me, it's definitely not a thing anymore. Mm -hmm. To some people, it's still a thing. And we haven't quite figured out, we had Doug Slynn on a couple months ago to talk a little bit about what's going on. We haven't quite figured out how to crack the nut of how to talk about where something is at when people are disagree about whether it's even like an active movement or not. But there was uh, news this week or the past couple of weeks about the court cases around Occupy Worcester. Do you know? Do you know about this? Nope. Well, I'm going to tell you this for this is you're hearing it here first. You're hearing it here first. I don't think the Telegram. They're hearing it second. I'm hearing it I don't first. Think yeah, you go. The, the Telegram. I don't think reported on this. So there were something like 22 people who were arrested the night that Occupy Worcester attempted to occupy the area behind City Hall, the common, there. and yes. camp out there. We were both. There. We were both there. And. Um, some number, most of the people, most of the 22 people who were arrested were arrested trying to camp out. Mm -hmm. And most of these people, like, made a plea bargain or whatever you want to call it, paid a, paid a fine and walked, and it was fine. Um, five of them, five people did not do this. Um, and not everybody who was arrested that night that was actually arrested behind there trying to camp. Doug Slynn, who's been on the show, mm -hmm. who was the legal, one of the legal observers, was arrested being a legal observer in the wrong place at the wrong time, or, or police vindictiveness or whatever you want to think that this was i guess we'll find out he's actually like bringing this to court mm -hmm. so we will find out what the story is with with doug when he goes to court i guess um uh joshua um what do i want to say um one guy whose name i'm super blanking on now uh, dude i'm sorry because we were just hanging out yesterday um like lives near there and it was basically like frustrated that the police were like trying to make him not walk on his own sidewalk mm -hmm. he felt like or in his own neighborhood and got arrested hmm. wasn't really an occupied guy until after that he became an occupied guy and sort of radicalized him this arrest um, and then there was a procession of the the many of the people who were watching all this happen to the to the jail you know to, to wait for people to get let out of jail mm -hmm. the procession a lot of it was in the road and um at some point they said you guys gotta like not walk down the road they said this a number of times don't walk down the road finally they were like no we're gonna arrest you if mm -hmm. you keep walking the road so everybody got out of the road at that point people didn't want to push it and um but uh uh one guy ran into the road thinking that everybody would run into the road and we could all you know, they're not gonna arrest us all but in fact nobody everybody else was just like what are you doing they arrested him Holly Jones, to her great credit, saw this and was like, what the hell? And like ran up to the cops and were like, you can't arrest him. And they're like, we can and we're going to arrest you for standing on the road too. And she's like, what? And then they arrested Holly Jones. And then uh, Joshua Swalek, I haven't actually talked to him about this, but my understanding is he was sort of there and walked out into the road at some point and like got arrested for mm -hmm. walking out into the road as part of that crowd. So uh, there were various reasons that people were arrested that night, mostly for camping out. Five of the, five people uh, filed a motion to decided to like actually take this to court. File a motion for to dismiss. Um, four of them. Four, somebody's phone. Four of them. Four of them. The motion was denied. These would be uh, um, um, Doug Slynn, Jason Howard, Matthew Laverne, who's been on the show, and Thomas Casello, who I don't think has been on the show. One of them, Joshua Swalex, was actually was was charged with being a disorderly person, and his motion was denied. Was 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 uh, sustained this week. His case was dismissed. The judge said it is unclear whether the, the defendant was given fair warning to let him know that what he was doing was illegal before he was placed under arrest. So there you go. That's this is like so. Here's some actual Occupy Worcester news. Whether there's other Occupy Worcester news going on again is contentious. Do you have any comment about this? No, I, I do look forward to someone deciding whether or not it is actually a thing, though. Yes. Well, we'll, we'll, if it is a thing, can we give them the key to the city? We can totally give them the key to the city if it's a thing. They do have to give it back though. Too. They're not keeping it. We'll let a pawn it for something. Can we answer this and put this on this person on the uh, the show? You want to hold the camera sure. and talk for a second? We'll I've really got nothing to say, but we'll just watch you over here. Is it anybody of consequence? It's nobody. It's nobody who was arrested. 
just certainly someone from consequence, but no one who was arrested. Okay, so the other thing we're going to talk about today before the show is done is what is one of the most Worcester things I've ever seen. Oh, speaking of most Worcester things, um, I, you know, I put out a tweet this week to uh, Miss Worcester, or a young lady who refers to herself as Miss Worcester, asking yes. if she'd like to be on the show. I never heard back. But she should if be there's on the show. if there's anybody in, uh, who watches the show who is uh, friends with or knows, I believe her name is Erica Dunn, uh, and she goes. By the, the, the name Miss Worcester. And you'll know her because she has the These city seal tattooed on her chest. Her, so this, if you can picture this, right, giant, just like all up here, like that's, yeah, she stands out because of that. But we, I think we actually should have her on the show. We can't have a show called 508, a show about Worcester, and not have somebody who is named Miss Worcester on the show. Erica, I'm not saying that if you're on the show that we're going to give you the key to the city, but we'll give you the key to the city. I mean, we don't even get to keep the key to the city. Actually, you, actually, you sure. could probably, yeah, that we could probably work something out. But um, okay, so so uh, John, so yeah. I've been doing some John Lurie research recently because I want to write up a little thing in Happiness Money about John Lurie. Do you know? Do, do you do you know who John mm-hmm. Lurie is? Okay, so I like I don't know. Like I feel like many younger people in Worcester at least have no idea who this guy is. This is a guy who grew up in the city of Worcester. He wasn't born in Worcester, but he grew up in Worcester. He left Worcester when he got out of high school, and as I understand it, basically never looked back and was like, Worcester's stupid. <laughs> but and John Lurie was like a legendary jazz sax player in the '80s and the '90s, out of sort of the downtown New York scene. He had his band, the Lounge Lizards. He was a, a, an experimental sax player, experimental band leader. Um, he starred in a bunch of um, uh, ind- indie movies, sort of like early '80s indie movies. Mm-hmm. Uh, these Jim Jarmusch movies, the one like awards at the Cannes Film Festival and stuff. So he was just like this sort of renaissance man. In recent years, he's become ill with uh, Lyme disease, but he's like painting art and like being very successful worldwide with his art. In fact, in a bizarre form of success, actually one of his paintings became this big internet meme in Russia in 2006. Uh, so anyway, John Lurie, Worcester guy. I've just been trying to tell people, like, this guy John Lurie has this Worcester connection. Isn't that interesting? And people are always like, who is he? So I'm trying to explain it, Happiness Pony, who is John Lurie and why do mm-hmm. you care? I was reading this one interview with him. This is on a, the website Perfect Sound Forever. I want to read this. This is a quote from John, Mr. Lurie, in this article. He says, I'm going to assume that this is around the early 70s at some point that this story happens. He says, I was on Main Street. I wish I could have had a super low. We don't have anyone with a super low gravelly John Lurie voice. Like, I was on Main. I can't do it. I was on Main Street in Worcester, Massachusetts at 4 a.m. just walking around. I ran into this black guy. He was about 22. This guy was pushing a wheelbarrow of dirt down the street. He explained that he was going to plant an organic garden on his roof. He also told me that he had just seen a statue turn into an angel. He said it in such a way that I believed him. We started talking about music. He took me to his house, where I had to be very quiet because his mother was asleep. He gave me a tenor saxophone and a bicycle. This is how I started playing the saxophone. I love that story. That's just it's amazing. Says, no, I mean, for somebody to actually go away, it, it, to, to leave Worcester behind them, never want to turn, turn never want to look mm-hmm. back or say a nice thing about the city, but in mm-hmm. some way actually be able to tie their success as a, as, as a jazz musician to Events that happening absurd... at 4 a.m. on Main Street. And this guy today, the guy with the wheelbarrow, probably would have been arrested before he made, made it, made, was able to actually interact with John. Yes. And, yeah. Well, so Brian Goslow, great Worcester journalist, uh noted this this quotation when I put it on when I blogged it and said he thinks that the guy with the wheelbarrow would have been Mr. Butch Madison mayor of Kendall Square and legendary Worcester drummer really um so Brian hopefully Brian and I are going to somehow track down somebody who could confirm that this is at least probably Butch Madison huh. Mr. Butch um I would love to also put that in happiness pony I'm going to at least put so any if there's people out there who would like have any Knowledge about Butch Madison and whether or not he gave John Lurie his saxophone. Yeah, we'll 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 nail it down. Uh, I just love that story. I sort of want to read that story in every episode of Five Boy from now on. You never hear that sort of thing come from uh, Carmine Ragusa. Big Ragu doesn't have that sort of. Did anybody? Well, you know. No one ever gave him a saxophone. Do we know? Do we know the story of how the Big Ragu got his start in acting? No. Potentially involved in something at 4 a.m. on Main Street. It's going to be a nice research project for 508. There you go. Well, everyone, thanks for watching the show. I hope that you become interested in bees. You know, it's been a big year for bees. We're reading a New York Times article that this is like a, such a perfect spring for bees that there's like a lot of extra swarming going on compared to what there normally is. The bees are rebounding in the United States. Be part of the bee renaissance. 
Again, we don't know what Jen told you because she was surrounded by a, a, a swarm of angry bees at the time. We were like, cowering inside. But Worcester has like the oldest county level beekeeping association in the United States. There's all these people who can totally hook you up with like how to be a beekeeper. I think the cost is about $150, everything included, if you want to do bees at your house. Um, and there's like, again, these bee people are like intense. They will help you, I think. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't really know if there's anything big coming up. We have only been doing about a show a month over the summer, so we probably shouldn't talk too much about what's coming up. I hope people have a great 4th of July. Happy Independence Day. Happy Independence Day. 